Man, it's so good to see you guys, and uh, we are jumping into a brand new series this morning, a study through the book of Ecclesiastes that we are calling Under the Sun, and so if you have your Bibles, we love to celebrate God's truth being shared, so turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 today. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and we're only going to read just a couple of verses at the beginning here, and then we're going to go through quite a lot of scripture today. Most of it will be on the screen, so you can follow along. If you like to take notes or follow along digitally, you can do that on the YouVersion Bible app. There's a place there under events where you can find us, and all of our notes are there this morning. But uh, here's what uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 says, start in verse 1. He says, The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And aren't you glad you came to church this morning? It's a great day to start out a worship service, right? A great way to start out a worship service. Well, here's the thing. I think uh, you've probably been like me and found your, yourself asking some questions in life. Just kind of let me know if you've ever asked yourself some of these questions before. Like, what's the meaning of life? Have you ever been there? Maybe uh, some of you in your college years or something like that just kind of were going, what, you know, what's the meaning? What's the purpose? What are we doing here? What's that whole thing about? Uh, why do I have to work so hard and still feel unrewarded? Or for that matter, why do I have to work at all? Like, what's the point of this job that I have or this, uh, this career that I'm pursuing? Uh, here's another question. If we're all going to die, what difference does any of this stuff make anyway? Like, why am I working so hard, doing so much, straining so hard for something that when I'm gone, everybody's just going to forget about it anyway. I'm going to be gone. And this is it. This is what we've got to live for. So why do we do this? Uh, here's another question. Is it worth it to follow God? I mean, is it really worth it to pursue this Christian faith? I mean, I'm watching people in the world, and they seem like they can just do whatever they want to, and there's no rules, no problems, no issues. They can just pursue anything, and it doesn't matter how they live. So is this pursuit of God, is it really worth it in my life? What's this stuff all about? Well, you've probably asked those questions before. I know that I have. And uh, the truth is, I mean, I, I've got a great job. I've got a great family. I've got a great life. But there's still times that I kind of walk around and just got, I mean, as much as I love my job and being here, there are still times that I'm just like, what in the world is this for? I mean, what am I doing? I, I think I could probably make more of a difference or an impact selling chicken nuggets at Chick-fil-A. I really do. Uh, and so maybe that would be where I could have a better influence on people. Uh, actually, after our vacation last week, I think if I had to work anywhere, it'd be at Disney. I think I would just go down there and be like, just going to work with the mouse, man. You know, like that's going to be it. Um, but when we think about life, there's questions that we all come around to, and life offers a lot of challenges, a lot of questions. And that's why for the next five weeks, we're going to study the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're not going to hit every chapter, every verse, but we're going to go on a big picture search of what is happening in this book and what is being said to us by God uh, to find the idea that so many people would agree with that life is meaningless. And yet, as believers in Christ, we are the kind of people who are saying life's not meaningless. It's full of meaning. Everything has meaning. You just have to know where to find it and how to find it. And so we're going to pursue this, uh, this study through the book. And if you've ever read Ecclesiastes before, this might be one of those things that you're kind of going, man, Ecclesiastes is always one of those weird books that when I've studied it, read it for myself, uh, it just kind of bums me out. It's really, uh, it, it's a glass half empty kind of book in the Bible. It really is. Uh, someone, a commentator once said that Ecclesiastes feels like the only book of the Bible that was written on a Monday morning kind of thing. You know, it's like... Somebody woke up one day and just went, no, this is just meaningless. I don't know why. Have you guys ever experienced that kind of thing? Mondays are just the hardest days, aren't they? Yeah, even after a great long weekend, Mondays are still the hardest day of the week for us to get our kids out of bed and off to school. It's like you guys haven't done anything for two days. Why is it so hard for you to get up and go? Mondays are hard. Does anybody get terrible emails on Mondays? Isn't that the worst day to go back into the office and be like, oh, here we go. I'm going to open this inbox and we're going to find out what happened all weekend long, all the mess. Uh, in church world, a lot of my friends, uh, Monday as pastors, Monday is the day they take off. They're like, after Sunday, I don't want to hear from anybody. Because <laughs> um, Monday is when I know I'm going to come into my office with emails. Uh, I'm not like this, by the way. You guys are great. You don't email me. Uh, we always tell you, email Brian. Um, but uh, the complaints don't always come my way. But I have pastor friends who are like, man, Mondays are when you get the emails that say things like, hey, pastor, the music was too loud. Hey, pastor, I didn't like the songs we sang. 
Hey, pastor, somebody offended me picking up my kid from the children's ministry. Hey, pastor, the bathrooms weren't clean. I just wanted you to know that. Like, I can change any of that, you know. Uh, and so, but that's, you know, Mondays. That's Monday. And so a lot of my friends are like, I'm just not going to go into the office on Monday. I'm going to come in on Tuesday. And it's like, well, then guess what? Tuesday is your Monday. That's when you're going to get all that same stuff. So everything that we go through in life, though, just feels like, I mean, is there really meaning to this? Is there really meaning behind what I'm doing? And so when we get into the book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to really find out some things about what it means to follow God and find meaning in life, in a life that sometimes feels meaningless. In fact, I want us to jump in this morning back in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. I just want to look at this one verse for a second. It says, the words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And so here's why I want us to look at that, because it's important to know when you're jumping into a book and studying a book, uh, who wrote the book, what it's about, what the perspective is that's being offered. And so I want us to understand that the, uh, the person here who writes the book, he says, that I'm the words of the teacher. That word teacher in Hebrew is koheleth. And so it's a difficult word to decipher, but most, the best translation that people come away with is the word teacher, or even better yet, preacher. And so this is someone who's saying, uh, these are the words of the preacher. The preacher is someone who gathers in assembly, who calls people together, and then has something to say to them. And so he says, I am the teacher of my people. I'm the one who brings the gathering together, and I instruct them in how we're going to live and how we're going to follow God. So he says, these are the words of the teacher. Then he goes on and says, I'm the son of David, the king in Jerusalem. And so there are a lot of people who question the authorship of this book, and a lot of people who think that, uh, that maybe someone was writing uh, from an outside perspective and using Solomon as, a, uh, as kind of a, a, a study to say, I'm writing as if I were Solomon. Uh, I don't take that view. I really think that this is Solomon writing. And I'm going to show you some passages of Scripture in just a second that I think would support that view. But I think that when you look at this, you see that Solomon is going to be the guy who's writing. He says, I, the teacher, was king of Israel in Jerusalem. That's in verse 12. He says, I was the king of, of Israel in Jerusalem. Now, only David and Solomon ruled over a unified kingdom of Israel. Before David, the kingdom wasn't unified. There were multiple tribes uh, think about like maybe the United States and the 13 original colonies. They were the tribes, but they weren't a unified kingdom. We didn't become the United States of America until much longer. It was individual colonies, right? The 12 tribes of Israel were kind of that same way under King Saul and before King Saul. Then David became king. And when David became king, after several years of fighting and trying to bring people together, the unified kingdom of Israel came together. All 12 tribes united under one kingdom rule under David as king of everyone. Then under Solomon, that continued. That Solomon reigned over a unified kingdom, that he brought prosperity and great peace to Israel. He built the temple, he built the palace, he did all these amazing things, and it happened under his watch as the kingdom of Israel. After uh, Solomon, however, the kingdom was divided again. And there were ten tribes that managed to stay together, and then there were two tribes. And so you have a divided kingdom once again. So he's given us some context here and some clues. And he says in verse 12, I, the teacher, was king of Israel in Jerusalem. He's ruled over this. And so we're going to kind of kind of put this stuff together and say, this is Solomon who we're talking about. He's the king. And so I want you to go and look at a, a couple of passages here with me. Uh, starting in Ecclesiastes 1, look at verses 12 through 18. He says again, I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. And I said to myself, look, I've increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this, too, is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. And so the author here, Koheleth, he says, here's what I endeavored to do. I had more wisdom than anyone before me. And I set my mind and my knowledge and my wisdom to go out and pursue things and explore things and investigate things and find out what the meaning and the purpose of life was. And basically, here's what I found. God has put a heavy burden on mankind. And then he gets to the end of verse 18. With much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. And you go, what in the world does he mean by that? And I think he simply means that the more you know and the more you have an understanding about how the world works, the more you kind of get an understanding of how broken it really is. 
And that as he applies his mind and his knowledge and his wisdom to explore things that God created to be right and to be good, that when he explores it and when he sees the brokenness and the devastation of the world and how much sin has impacted it and affected it, he looks at those things and he goes, all I can think is the more knowledge that I have, the more wisdom that I have, the more sorrow and the more grief I also find. Because I know how things should be. And I see how things are broken. And so he says, I've explored all of these things, and my wisdom was what led me along this path. And so as we kind of figure out these things, I believe that some statements point directly to Solomon being the only person who could write this book. I mean, do you remember the story about how Solomon became king over Israel? Uh, go back and, and look with me in 1 Kings chapter 3, uh, and we're going to read a few passages of Scripture together here. 1 Kings chapter 3, start in verse 4. These are going to be on the screen for you to see, but if you want to follow along in your Bible, feel free to do that. 1 Kings chapter 3. Verse 4, he says, The king Solomon went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God, asked, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. I mean, how many of you guys would love God to ask you that question? That'd be pretty good, right? Hey, go ahead, anything you want, you just ask, and I promise I'll give it to you. What would you ask for? Some of you would be like, uh, Ferrari in the driveway, that'd be nice, you know, house payment being paid off. Whatever it is you would ask for, God gives Solomon permission and says, ask for anything you want, I'll do it for you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You've continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son now to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I'm only a little child. And I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? And the Lord was pleased that Solomon had, answered, had asked this. So God said to him, since you've asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. And then Solomon awoke and he realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the ark of the Lord's covenant, and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. And then he gave a feast for all of his court. And so Solomon has this moment where God says, ask for anything you want. Solomon says, I'm young and inexperienced. I need understanding in how to discern uh, knowledge, knowledgeable uh, government and administration and justice in my kingdom. And so God says, since you asked for that, for wisdom, I'm going to give you wisdom, but I'm also going to bless you with the things you didn't ask for. I'll give you wealth. I'll give you honor. I'll give you prestige. And so Solomon gains all of these things. Look at, in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29. It said, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight. God was faithful to answer that question. And he also gave him, a, uh, or that, uh, that request, he also gave him a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east, greater than all of the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Israelite, wiser than Haman, Calico, and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life, from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Right? And so Solomon becomes the most wise man, maybe who has ever lived, outside of probably, I believe, Jesus who was in his human form fully God and had the knowledge and the wisdom of God. Solomon has this wisdom. And as we get into the next week, we're going to see all that the author of Ecclesiastes did in his life. Under his wisdom, with his wisdom, with his wealth, with his experience, he pursues everything you can possibly imagine. 
And as he pursues things, one of the things that we're going to find out about Solomon is that there comes a point in time in his life, and part of the reason that he's writing this book is that he begins to pursue things and leave God out of them. That he's just going to go on a, on a crazy pursuit of incredible knowledge, letting his wisdom guide him, but leaving God out of the center of it. And so we're going to talk about why uh, Solomon does what he does and how it makes sense for us. So again in 1 Kings, let's read one more passage together. Again in 1 Kings, uh, we see about the splendor and the wisdom of Solomon and also his wealth. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 23 says this, King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom that God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift, articles of silver and gold, robes, we uh, weapons and spices, and horses and mules. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. The king, I love this, the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Right, in 1 Kings chapters 4 through 10, we just get a view of Solomon's wealth, the opulence of Jerusalem, the amazing prestige that Israel gains. And we start to see that his kingdom is burgeoning and flourishing, that he is providing things for the kingdom of Israel that they've never dreamed of, that they surpass Egypt and all the kingdoms of the east. And so in all of these things, we can look at this and kind of go, this is why I believe that this points to Solomon being the author of this book. That who else other than the wisest, richest man on the planet could pursue all of these things, could have the knowledge to explore all of these things, and then write about them so that we have it contained and have it to, to record and to study for ourselves. So that's why I believe that Solomon was uniquely qualified to write this book. Solomon was a, a man who had the means to explore the mysteries of the world, the mysteries of faith in God, and the deepest questions of the human heart. So he's going to do that, and as we jump into the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, I just want to tell you how I kind of interpret this book and, uh, and give you a brief summary of how I look at it. And so uh, I believe that Solomon, as he writes this, that Solomon is writing in the back end of his life. I believe Solomon, as he writes Ecclesiastes, is an older man. He's been through everything, and now he's writing from his perspective of an older man who's done all of this stuff, and he's writing back, looking at everything he's experienced in order to give us a perspective on how to live our lives under God's glory and what happens if we leave God out of the equation. I believe that's why, why Solomon writes this book, that he wants us to see there is meaning and purpose in life, but... My experience, my perspective has been, if you pursue everything in life and you leave God out of it, then there will be a meaningless feeling to your life. So Solomon's an older guy writing from the back end. Now Solomon certainly made his share of horrible mistakes. I mean, one of the things that God said to him is, I'll continue to bless you in these ways if you follow in the steps of your father David, who had a heart who was dedicated to me. And Solomon lost his way. Solomon, in the kind of middle stages of his kingdom, he lost his way. He, he started to pursue women from outside kingdoms and marry them. That was, a, that was forbidden under God's law. And as he married these women and brought in their culture and their customs into Israel, he also introduced their gods into the culture of Israel. And Solomon started to worship other gods. And the people of Israel started to pursue other gods, idols, false gods. And as he pursued all of those things, the, the mistakes that Solomon made really had incredible consequences. Because again, he's doing all of these things in the middle of his life, searching for, for meaning, pursuing meaning. He's pursuing pleasure, he's pursuing goodness, but he's doing it without God at the center of it. He's doing it while he's pursuing things that are leaving God out of the mix. And so as an older man who I believe then at a stage in, in an older stage in his life came back to God, he's writing this book now. And he's writing to look back, and, and I think it's kind of from a father's perspective to his kids. Have you ever had a conversation with your kids and said, hey, man, here's something that I just want you to know. Uh, there were mistakes I've made in my life, and I want to tell you about my mistakes so that you don't repeat them. I want you to know about the mistakes I made, the problems that I've run into, the, the things that I've tried to do that were a mess for me. And I want you to know about these things so that you won't make the same mistake that I did. That's what Solomon's going for. As he's writing this book, this is almost one of those ways that you can look at and see, this is Solomon as a father writing to us and saying, be cautious. Because if you do the things that I did, you're going to come to this conclusion. Life is meaningless. 
Life doesn't have any purpose, and nothing that I do matters at all. And so as Ecclesiastes, as we get into this, I think that's what Solomon is writing from. Now, there are two verses that I want to share with you that I believe kind of frame the book. And today serves in a lot of ways as just an introduction to what we're doing. So uh, hang on with me so you kind of know what we're talking about and where we're going before we dive in deeper throughout this study. But uh, there's two verses that I think really frame this book. The first one is in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. And Solomon writes this and says, God has set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. See, here's why I believe this is an important verse within the middle of this book. He says, God has set eternity in the human heart, and yet no one can fathom from beginning to end what God has done. Inside each and every one of us, there is a knowledge, there is a longing, whether you admit it or not, there is something inside of you that tells you there's more to life than just what happens on planet earth. God has put a desire for eternity in every one of us. All of us long for an existence with God outside of the realm of this space and this time. And so he says, God has put eternity in our hearts, and yet, even with eternity there, we don't grasp from beginning to end what God has done. We have a limited understanding, a limited scope and perspective on eternity. We only see a portion of the bigger picture. We see a limited grasp of what God's done. That's why it's so difficult for us. In this world, when tragedies happen and when horrific things happen in our world, this is why it's so difficult for us to see these tragedies unfold and say, where is God in the middle of that? How is God glorified in that? Where is there meaning in that? And the honest truth is, is that we know Scripture points to a reality, that God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And there's other passages that says that God is working out for good all things. For those of us who believe in Him, who are called according to His purposes, according to Christ Jesus. And yet with our limited perspective, our limited scope of understanding, we look at things and go, there can't be meaning in that. There can't be. How is God glorified in that tragedy? How is God glorified in His death? How is God glorified in that diagnosis? There can't be, right? But the truth is, is that we have such a limited perspective on what's happening from beginning to end that we don't know how God is working out all of the pieces and the details for His glory. But God has set eternity in our hearts. We believe there's something bigger than this life, something beyond us. God has set eternity in our heart, and that's important for us to grasp and understand as we go through this book. Now, the second verse that I think helps frame this book is this, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Solomon writes and says this, This only have I found. God created mankind upright, but men have gone in search of many schemes. Right? I mean, this is part of the human experience. In fact, for me, this is the entire story of humankind. God has made, created, made mankind upright, and yet men have gone in search of many schemes. And so when we think about this and we see this, we understand that God created us upright to walk in perfect fellowship with Him. But we're schemers, and we look to replace God with other lesser things. We take all of the things that God has given us and blessed us with, and we say, all of the blessings you've poured out on us, we're going to take those and make them God. We're going to replace you. We're going to scheme against you, or we're going to blame you. Ecclesiastes 7.29 actually describes the doctrine of original righteousness. That we were created upright, good, holy, in perfect relationship with God. That our first parents, Adam and Eve, they were created in righteousness to walk in perfect fellowship with God. And so we see this doctrine of original righteousness. But even in the middle of all of that, we want to blame God for everything that goes wrong in the world and for the problems that we face in life. God created men upright, but we are the ones who pursued schemes. We sought after schemes. God made us upright. We went after other things, right? That's the doctrine of original sin. So in Ecclesiastes, you see the doctrine of original righteousness. In Genesis 3, you see the doctrine of original sin. And it's in Genesis chapter 3 that we start to figure out this, that we are all broken, sin-filled people, and that no one is exempt. What God created was destroyed when Adam and Eve sought to replace a relationship with God with knowledge like God. 
that Adam and Eve have the perfect relationship with God. God, I can walk with you, be with you, know you intimately and fully. But there's a, there's a suggestion over here from this serpent that says, if I eat the, the fruit, I started to say apple. We don't know what it was. It's just a piece of fruit, okay? Because if I eat this fruit, the promise is from the serpent that I'll know good and evil like you. And so we begin from that very first moment to scheme and say, if, if, if being with God is great, but knowing what God knows, how much better must that be? Let's pursue that. And then in the middle of the scheming, what do we do? When we recognize, and when Adam and Eve recognized their sin, they broke God's one law. They ate the fruit. They said, this is the one thing God told us not to do, but we're going to do it anyway because in our scheming minds, we think that's going to elevate us to a higher level of understanding, and we're going to be like God in some way that we're not right now. And so we pursued these schemes, and then what happened? They realized that they had sinned. And the first thing that Adam did was that he blamed God. He blamed God. God created mankind upright, but we went in search of schemes. And then we started blaming God for all of the problems that we've experienced. God, the woman that you put here with me, she made me eat. That's what Adam said. From the very beginning, God is blamed for our problems. And we do that same thing today. God, life seems meaningless and it's your fault. You haven't shown yourself, done something more, been better, accomplished what I wanted you to accomplish. This is on you. And life just feels meaningless. Don't we do that? I find myself with those thoughts all the time. That's how humanity approaches life. And so we want to blame God for everything. That time in the garden was the first time that men looked for, for meaning outside of God. And we've been scheming ever since and how to replace him. And what we do when we try to replace God is we take things that are lesser than God. And we'll try to say, okay, this, this object, this thing that I want to put, uh, put all of my energy behind, this thing is going to be so great. And it's a scheme. It's something that you're saying is going to replace God in your life. But ultimately, you're going to find that it's going to leave you empty. And so here's what I want you to know. And if you're following along, the book of Ecclesiastes is a master class on looking for meaning in life and everything under the sun minus God. So here's the next point on your outline if you're following along. Here's what Solomon finds. Substitutes for God always fall short. Substitutes for God always fall short. The things that we elevate in importance above God are idols. That's all it is. And there's a problem with idols, right? There's a major problem with idols. Idols promise to deliver everything but they deliver nothing. Anything that you exalt above God has a promise that it's going to make your life better. It's going to make you happy. It's going to fulfill you. It's going to satisfy you. The promise of anything that we hold up as an idol is that it will make us satisfied where God leaves us empty. And then we'll pursue that until we find that none of those things work. Substitutes for God always fall short. Anything you elevate in your life that you think is going to satisfy you in a way that God can't is going to fall short. Uh, let me read a passage to you from Jeremiah chapter 10, uh, verses 1 through 16. This is actually in the message translation, and so it's not going to be on your screen this morning, but if you're following along uh, on the YouVersion app, it should be in the middle of that app. Um, but this is what the message says in Jeremiah 10. It says, listen to the message that God is sending your way, house of Israel. Listen most carefully. Don't take the godless nations as your models. Don't be impressed by their glamour and their glitz, no matter how much they're impressed. The religion of these people is nothing but smoke. An idol is nothing but a tree chopped down, then shaped by a woodman's axe. They trim it with tinsel and balls, use hammer and nails to keep it upright. It's like a scarecrow in a cabbage patch. It can't talk. It's dead wood that has to be carried. It can't walk. Don't be impressed by such stuff. It's useless for either good or evil. All this is nothing compared to you, O oh God. You're wondrously great, famously great. Who can fail to be impressed by you, king of the nations? It's your very nature to be worshipped. Look far and wide among the elite of the nations. The best they can come up with is nothing compared to you. Stupidly, they line them up, a lineup of sticks, good for nothing but making smoke. 
gilded with silver foil from Tarshish, covered with gold from Euphaz, hung with violet and purple fabrics. No matter how fancy the sticks, they're still sticks. But God is the real thing, the living God, the eternal king. When he's angry, earth shakes. Yes, and the godless nations quake. Tell them this, the stick gods who made nothing, neither sky nor earth, will come to nothing on the earth and under the sky. But it is God whose power made the earth, whose wisdom gave shape to the world, who crafted the cosmos. He thunders and rains and rain pours down. He sends the clouds soaring. He embellishes the storm with linings, launches wind from his warehouse. Stick god worshipers, looking mighty foolish, god makers, embarrassed by their handmade gods, their gods are frauds, dead sticks, dead wood gods, tasteless jokes. When the fires of judgment come, they'll be ashes. But the portion of Jacob is the real thing. He put the whole universe together and pays special attention to Israel. His name the God of angel armies. And I love that. Because when sin came into the world, we began to replace the worship of God and relationship with God with other lesser things. And guess what? It didn't work. It didn't work. Anything that we try to replace God with ends up failing, and we find that a, a, an idol is nothing uh, but just sticks and wood. And so now, for us, uh, I know that we're not foolish enough to worship stick gods, right? Like, we don't do that. I bet if I came to your house that I wouldn't walk in and you would have some scarecrow-looking thing, like he says, a scarecrow from Cabbage Patch. You wouldn't have that. Then when you open the door and you walk in, you bow down to it and go, oh, you're so great, right? You wouldn't have that. Uh, I probably wouldn't find that in your house, but probably not a statue of gold, you know, unless you've got one of those little Buddha dudes in your house. And so, um, but even that, you're probably not, you know, putting it on your, you know, edge of your nightstand and worshiping it before you go to sleep at night. That stuff's probably not in your house, right? And so you're probably going, you know what, that idolatry stuff, that's crazy, that's Old Testament things, and people worshiped idols, and they didn't understand, and they didn't know. But I don't have idols. I don't have things like that in my life. Well, there's a quote that I came across that I thought was really good to help us just think through this a little bit. Daniel Aiken, in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, said this, A good thing turned into a God thing becomes a bad thing. A good thing that turns into a God thing becomes a bad thing. So think about in your life, what are some things maybe that you would look at and say, you know what, it's not, it's not a gold statue, it's not sticks assembled together to look like a person that I'm going to worship but can I ask you a question? Have you elevated your marriage to be a God in your life? Have you elevated your kids to be little gods in your life? They're running your life. You're just chasing them around, doing whatever they want to do. They've become central to you. Has your job become a God in your life? Is that something that you worship? Is your technology, is your phone, is your bank account, what is it that you would look at in your life and go, this is God? And how do you determine if it is God or not? Think about how much time you invest in it. Think about if it's the first thing you think of when you wake up in the morning. Think about if it's the last thing you think of as you go to bed at night. How many of us make gods out of things that were never intended to be gods? Students, athletics, academics, is that God to you? Are your possessions God to you? Is pleasure a God to you? What have you made central in your life that you're saying, if I use these things, I'll replace God in my life, and this will make me satisfied. This will fill me up. I know if I have this, then I'll be great. None of those things is good when they become God. Everything begins to lose its meaning, and all of these things just become schemes that we pursue instead of pursuing God. And we've got to get back to a place where we put God at the center. But there's one more grand delusion that Satan implants in our hearts. Here's the last God that I would talk about this morning. Here's the worst God. Satan would implant in our hearts that you should be God. You should be God. Right? You ever had that thought to pop up? I mean, I have. I have that thought all the time. I know better. God, I know what your word says, but I want to do this. I want to be God. God, I know the wisdom of what, what has been taught to me, but I think I know more. I want to be God. God, I don't want there to be consequences. I want to be in control. I want to do whatever I want. I know better than you. We just want to be God. 
right? This is the grand delusion of a meaningless life. God, I'm going to take you out of the central role in my life, and I'm going to put me there. There's a throne on my heart, and I'm going to sit in it. I'm in charge. I rule. I reign. You can advise if you want to, but guess what happens when God advises and I'm in control? I don't have to listen to his advice. But if I put God on the throne of my heart, and I say, you're king, you're Lord, whatever you say I'll do, I will bow in submission to you, then when God says something that I know to be right, and he's in charge, I'm going to say, yes, sir, and I'm going to take a back seat, and I'm going to do what God says. But the grand delusion of life that Satan would implant in our hearts is that you should be God. That's what's going to add meaning to your life. You be in control. You do whatever you want to do. The problem with that is that everything you can control, every scheme you can devise, every plan you can make happens under the sun. Now that phrase, under the sun, we haven't hit it yet in the book of Ecclesiastes, but we're going to. In fact, Solomon uses this term 29 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. He's going to talk throughout the entire book about life under the sun. And he's going to talk about this thing from the perspective of saying that everything in life, everything that happens is here. And the reason that so many people find life meaningless is because this life is all there is. This life is all that gives meaning. And so what happens under the sun is all that happens. So Solomon's asking the question of meaning in life from strictly an earthly perspective. If this world is all there is, there's no God, there's no afterlife, there's no judgment, then this world that we live in, this is meaningless. It's meaningless. This is where atheists and agnostics have such a difficult problem with. Because they can't understand and they can't grasp how their life should have any meaning if there's nothing beyond this life. Why am I doing anything that I'm doing? Why should there be rules? Why should there be consequences? If this is it, do whatever you want to and die. Solomon kind of takes this perspective and he's going to make everything else out. And he's going to say, if you do all of this and you leave God out, you're going to be left empty. Why is that true? Again, because of what he says in, in chapter 7. God has set eternity in our hearts. God has, has put eternity in our hearts. You have to get over the sun in order to determine why life has meaning. If you're going to live in this life, and this world is going to be all there is, under the sun is all there is, then life's going to seem meaningless. The things that you do are going to seem meaningless. Here's something that C.S. Lewis said that I love. He said, God cannot give you happiness and peace apart from, her, from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. So that's why we're going to explore Ecclesiastes for the next five weeks. It points us to finding meaning in life. The book is honest about the troubles of life and addresses questions our culture is asking today. Our culture is constantly asking, what's the meaning? What's the purpose? Why do people believe what they believe? And people think all the time, and maybe we're included in this, you know, if I only had more money or more success or more pleasure, or more friends, more time, then, then I'd really be happy. And Solomon points to that and says, you know what? I had all of that. I had as much money as you could possibly want. I had as much wisdom as you could possibly want. I had as much pleasure as you could possibly want. And when I look back on life, I open up my book and write, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. That's how it starts the book. And the reason is, is because he's left God out of the central part of his life. Here's the last thing that I want us to look at, the one last word. The Hebrew word meaningless is hevel. Uh, it literally means smoke or vapor or fog. So when Solomon writes and says life is utterly meaningless, he's saying that life is a hevel of hevels. Right? And so that terminology, the way he uses that is to reinforce, reiterate the intentionality of what he's trying to say. It's like saying the holy of holies. That's the most holy place on earth. Or Solomon's song of songs. It's Solomon's greatest song that he wrote. And so when Solomon writes and says that life is hevel of hevels, it is utterly without meaning. And so he says life is a vapor. It's a breath. It's just fleeting away. Right? And so it's Halloween season. We're getting put, you know, close to that part, point in time. And thanks to everybody who participated in our chunk or treat for autistic families yesterday. But it's Halloween season, so if you're you know, watching all those scary movies that you shouldn't probably be watching, uh, you see fog all over the place, right? And so there's fog in the cemetery and fog, you know, wherever the bad guy's chasing you around. And there's always fog. And we're like, why? Why is there always fog? Because fog is disillusioning. Fog is beautiful, 
but it's scary. Fog has this uh, kind of disorienting uh, kind of device to it. I mean, if you think about it, if you've ever, have you ever driven through a dense fog at night? That is crazy, right? Like all of a sudden, you're not going 55 anymore. You're like, I think we'll take 15. This should be a good speed to travel at. Maybe I'll try my bright lights. Nope, that's worse. Turn those off. Go back to the low beams. And so just driving in the middle of a thick fog, it's just completely disorienting. And Solomon says, that's what life is like when you don't know God. It's just disorienting. You're going through it. And you're trying to put other things at the center to explain life and give meaning to life and give purpose to life and add value to life. But it's just disorienting and distracting. Yeah, there's beauty to it, but it's also confusing. So he's basically going to tell us throughout this book, if you want to make sense of everything, you need to put God at the center of it. Because life isn't meaningless over the sun. Life can feel meaningless under the sun. But life isn't meaningless over the sun. You've got to know and understand that one day, God will bring clarity to the hevel. God will bring the sun to burn off the steam, to burn off the fog, to make it clear, to show you the way. God will bring that. Um, in his commentary called Ecclesiastes, Why Everything Matters, Philip Graham Ryken wrote this. In order to know and enjoy God properly, we first have to see the emptiness of life without him, becoming thoroughly disillusioned with everything the world has to offer. To this end, Ecclesiastes gives us a true assessment of what life is like apart from the grace of God. This makes it a hopeful book, not a depressing one. Ultimately, it's a worldview, its worldview is positive, not negative. And so you kind of see all of this that we go, man, this isn't a negative book, it's a positive book. But we've got to understand the perspective of if you try to go through life, with, without God at the center, it's going to feel meaningless. In fact, it's going to feel like you're running on a hamster wheel, just spinning in place. Look at the next few verses in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and then we're going to start to close this up. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 4. Solomon writes and says, Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun sets, it hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and to the north, round and round it goes, every turn, uh, returning, uh, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place that the streams came from, they'll return there again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough seeing, the ear never has enough feel of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything for which anyone can say, look, there's something new. It was already here long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will be remembered by those who follow them, will not be remembered by those who follow them. So Solomon just points at life and goes, look, life is just an, a repeating cycle. It's just endless. You ever feel like you're on a hamster wheel? You know what you're going to do tomorrow? The same thing you did last Monday. You're going to get up. You're going to get dressed. You're going to go to work. You're going to work all day. You're going to come home. You're going to play with the kids. You're going to, you know, whatever you do. You know what you're going to do on Tuesday? You're going to get up and do that same thing again. And eventually in your life, you're going to die, and no one's going to remember all the things that you did every day on the hamster wheel. He says, this just generations come, generations go, but it's just, it's just meaningless. It's just meaningless. If you're putting all of your eggs in the basket of this, life is meaningless. God has put eternity in our hearts. Last illustration. This rope could potentially represent eternity. For us, and it stretches all the way to that side of the room, and we're going to let it stretch all the way over here to this side of the room. There you go. Look at that. There's a crazy golden rope of eternity. Why? Because gold represents eternity. You guys made the little bracelets in BBS, right? And so, uh, so we've got this rope that whew, we'll throw it on a little bit further over there. This is eternity. Imagine eternity just stretching and how far eternity goes. Eternity past, eternity forward, eternity uh, future. And then this little black spot on here represents life on earth. The 4,000, 6,000 years, years, whatever it's been, that we've had the creation of earth. And we've lived for this moment for so long. And then this one little white spot in the middle, if you can see that, that's your life. In the span of, of life on earth, that's you. And you know what we find when we think about life and eternity? That if we look back that way and if we look forward this way and we start to put together that Life on earth is not very long, and my life on earth is not very long, and there's some insignificance to that. Then can you ask yourself the question, why are you doing everything possible to make this life the thing that counts most? 
when God has said, I've put eternity in your hearts. So live for eternity. Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can happen, where thieves are going to break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where thieves can't break in and steal, where moth and rust aren't going to destroy. That's what you should live for. Live for the eternal perspective. That's what Solomon's going to challenge us with. If you find this life to be meaningless, it's quite possible that you've got your perspective focused on the wrong place, that you've sought to replace God with you or with something else. And anything lesser than God is always going to disappoint you. So here's how I want us to close up our time this morning. We're going to sing again together to to worship and close. But there's going to be a screen here that's got some questions that I want you to think through as you do sing this next song and participate in these next, next few minutes. Would you just ask yourself these questions? Does my life have the kind of meaning that God desires me to have? Is my life full of the meaning God wants me to have? And is God at the center of everything I'm doing? And then finally, after trying to fill my life with everything else, am I willing to turn my life over to God? Are you willing to do that? I want you to think on these questions as we sing this last song. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I love you. Thank you so much for giving us an understanding and awareness of who you are, for showing us your glory, for helping us to understand that life has meaning, but we've got to find it in you. So God, would you just help us today to put our hope in the God of our salvation? the God of angel armies. We love you, Jesus, and we ask these things in your name.